it's really uh, wonderful to be here. It is, it's uh, a long while since I've been to TAG, and uh, it has the same energy and atmosphere, and uh, I've been really enjoying uh, some of the papers. And yeah, the edginess, there is a sense of edginess here. And I'm going to kind of hopefully follow a little bit uh, along on that with um, a talk, and the title's in the Book of Abstracts. Um, it's a bit of an experiment because I'm going to uh, try and connect a couple of case studies which have a certain amount of detail uh, with a bigger picture. Um, and the bigger picture is about where, well, how I, hmm, my angle on what is best in archaeological theory at the moment and where it might be going. And I'm seeing a lot of wonderful potential, particularly around um, embracing kind of risk-taking, trying things out. Not that it's wrong to stay with tried and tested disciplinary method, procedure, whatever, but that tag, in the spirit of tag, it's right to try something out. Stretch the envelope, as we say in the US. Uh, and so it might not work. Uh, it might not work because it might not make any sense whatsoever, but let's give it a go. So the title is The Actuality of the Past, Experiences of an Archaeologist in Silicon Valley. Um, two key concepts that I'm going to kind of pull out, tease out of my little case studies this afternoon are actuality and experience. And I'll explain perhaps what they are. Um, the reference to being an archaeologist in Silicon Valley is, well, I guess that's where I am. Um, and it's really just... I'm not going to go into it very much. Perhaps it'll, you'll be able to see it, read between the lines, uh, as it were, of what I've got to say. Um, but really what I'm flagging up is something which has been, I've already heard, widely acknowledged in several papers, and that is that our standpoint where we are matters. We are not kind of, you know, um, distracted, uh, detached, transcendent, to use a concept we had just a few moments ago. We are not transcendent. We are immersed in the stuff that we are fascinated by, and of course, in our institutions, our communities, our careers, or whatever. And so that really is um, uh, the significance of standpoint. Uh, but if you do want a few uh, things, or things to hook Silicon Valley on uh, that regularly occur to me there, um, and it's themes such as these. Uh, the techno obsession with technology, and oh my God, are we not subject to that in archaeology? Don't get me wrong, I'm a keen early adopter of the best technologies, uh, but techno-utopianism, the idea that we can use an engineering mindset to fix everything, um, and then if we have just more better science and tech, we're going to be good. Um, and I kind of am going to, well, no, leave it at that. Um, another contrast... Uh, uh, that I very much see going on uh, in, in and around me is uh, it's about agency, really. It's about how you make things happen. And of course, Silicon Valley is typically associated with the notion of the startup, the small group, heterarchical group. That is, they've got a flat hierarchy. Um, they work together. It's a team. And they build stuff, make stuff, and then make a fortune when they sell it to Google. Um, and that brings in, of course, a, a whole series of contrasts they're not bifurcations, uh, with, and we see it all over the place, you know, the corporation, the startup versus or in relationship with state authorities. Um, and that's a big theme. It's very, very pertinent, I think, to more than just Silicon Valley. Another major contrast that we need to really tackle, grasp, overturn is the contrast between the real and the virtual. Um, it's an artificial, literally, distinction. And of course, what's on our agenda, but artificial intelligence and augmented realities. So those are kind of in the background a bit. But let me um, get going now. So I took the invitation, wonderful kind invitation, to join this session um, as an excuse really to talk about something like this. How might we overcome um, theory and practice, their connections, that don't really help us? And how don't they help us? Because they immerse us in regular problems that have been discussed at TAG since day one, 40 years ago, and are still here. And it's to do with things like, you know, the 
hunter-gatherers versus agriculturalists, uh, past and present and where does heritage fit in all of that, is history heritage? Can heritage ever be history? The real and the virtual, or the past being back there, and we need to come to terms with it in our description, our explanation, our interpretation, where primacy is given, of course, to what really happened in the past. And that involves a radical separation between an absent past and a present present, wherein we find the ruins, the traces of what happened. And that sort of takes us into issues of source materials. Is the archaeological record the source of knowledge of the past? Are we responding to what's left of the past and how? On what basis does that involve a bifurcation? Science, of course, and the arts and humanities. Practice and theory, one of the key um, focuses of time. So that is what I'm going to be addressing. And another way of putting it is what might, and I'm going to use this term here, an engaged archaeology look like? And that's my um, take on the conference theme, which is archaeological work, its pertinency to more than just the discipline of archaeology. Engagement beyond the discipline. So I've got a couple of, I'm going to call them premises. They're kind of starting points for, for me. They're not... Um, by all means, in any way, completely acknowledged, accepted, incontrovertible. Um, but the first one um, is that archaeologists do stuff. They do all sorts of things. Um, archaeology is an active uh, practice. Uh, and it's also a creative one because we make stuff. We make accounts. Uh, we organize projects. We deliver output, whatever that might be. We create museum exhibitions, or we help those. We teach classes. We organize institutions. In this, archaeologists are performing productive work. Well, it's not always productive. But it's call, let's call it creative. And we can argue, it is argued, whether it's good, bad, or whatever. But it is working, nevertheless. And so a running definition of archaeology, and again, we don't have to stick hard and fast to it is that archaeologists work with what remains. Let's just run with that. The second premise is that we do, of course, deal directly, uh, well, what does that mean, with the past. We handle objects. Uh, we work upon them. But we're working with them. Um, we transform. We translate. We mediate in a broader sense. That is, we write about things. We take photographs. We create databases which we sometimes call, well, representations, or the word that I've heard a good deal in the last few days, proxies. Um, this stands for that. That's mediation. And we connect past and present through, um, well, past and present imply relation, temporal relationships as well as spatial. And uh, I've got three um, uh, temporal uh, concepts of temporality that are going to lie in my case studies, just to flag them up here. First, the past is still with us. It has endured. Uh, we wouldn't be doing archaeology if it hadn't. Um, second, actuality, this concept I flagged up. Actuality is a beautiful, beautiful notion. And it's been much used in uh, philosophy, but also history. And indeed, is at the core of, I'm suggesting, what we do, whether in archaeology or heritage. Um, the actu actuality of the past is engagement with the past here, now, for the future. It's connection. The past is with us. Those are the grounds. That is the ground on which we work with it. That's the actuality of the past. The past in the present. And it has to be so, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to do it. And it is, therefore, and we can go into Bergson if you want here, but we're not because we don't have time. Um, it's based upon a duration of the past, lasting into the present, such that we can work with it. And indeed, it is kind of like a process of memory, of recall. The past in the present worked with to present ends for future projects, needs, whatever. And then we also have kairos, or kairotic time, if you like. I'm using the Greek term kairos, um, which is not just the past and the present, 
but an opportune moment. Now is the time to do this. We can do this now because we have the funding. That is chirotic, a chirotic opportunity, a moment. Um, Kairos is a kind of actuality, but it implies also a project that you want to do or that you want to address. And um, if Bergson, we might want to think of Bergson in terms of actuality and duration, um, Benjamin, Walter Benjamin is uh, perhaps who we might want to think of in terms of his notion, not of, well, he doesn't call it Kairos, but he calls it of now time or yet side. Okay, let's plunge, that's just giving some a little bit of orientation. Let's plunge into um, a couple of short cases. And the first one is, well, I wouldn't have, I'm sure, done this if I hadn't have been in and around the automotive industry uh, and such in California. Um, and it's something that's happening, and it's massive, it's enormous. I'm not sure how aware we are of it, uh, but it's happening in the heritage industry, the emergence of a new sector. And it is the archaeology, the heritage of automobiles. Um, I found it quite surprising that if you go, for example, to the Library of Congress website in the United States, um, it is a big um, database. It has many, 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 many sources, resources. It is a primary teaching, source of teaching materials uh, for the United States uh, schooling system. Um, you would imagine, given the history of the United States in the 20th century, you could tap in there the automobile and the Library of Congress database would return for you all sorts of stuff on the history, the heritage of the automobile. There's nothing. It's extraordinary. There is no national museum of the automobile that is a state-sponsored museum of the automobile anywhere in the world, in spite of the dependency of, let's call it, the 20th century uh, on the automobile. Um, it's largely in private hands, private collection, or it's the world of the enthusiast. Don't need to go any more into that. This is just a, an old wreck of a car. Um, but uh, there is an issue about whether to and how to restore it. Because the car has, well, some kind of claim to being special. Uh, this was a car uh, in the carpool of the Reich's Chancellery in 1945 uh, when the Russians arrived, uh, shelled uh, the Reich's Chancellery um, destroyed all the cars except this one, um, and then Hitler committed suicide, and the Red Army took this east. This was Hitler's car at the end. Uh, it's almost certainly the car that brought Ava Brown uh, in January 1945 to be with Hitler. And it, well, there's all sorts of stories around it, but it raise, has raised for the collecting world and on the Left here is Paul Russell, a restorer. Should you restore it? What are you going to restore? Why? Does it go in a museum? Does it have historical significance? What's it about? That's just the beginning of a series of questions around what might we do with the remains, and I'm calling it a kind of life world of 20th century automobility, automobiles. What's going to happen to them? Most of them are being scrapped, but now the collector's market is skyrocketing. Uh, it's the best thing to invest in, a classic car. Um, you'll do very well on the return in, of your investment. Let's take this car. This um, belonged to somebody, a British guy called Eddie Hall. Uh, he bought it in 1931, and here he is with his brand new Bentley. Um, what do we make of an automobile like this? It is in private ownership now. Um, it's, it was a regular Bentley, but a high-end automobile nevertheless. We have a series of stories around it, as well as the artifact itself. Uh, here it is. This is its current owner. Uh, in the middle there, that's uh, Miles Collier, uh, who bought it off another collector, Briggs Cunningham, who was a bit of a flamboyant California playboy, really, um, in the 1950s and 60s. So if we just start thinking about this automobile, old car, what are the issues that we might face in terms of how do we deal with it as an item that's being collected, looked after, and such? Um, it relates to, of course, the processes of its making, its manufacture, uh, corporate industry in the 20th century, 
Uh, Bentley by this time had been bought by Rolls-Royce. This is one of the Rolls-Royce works at Derby. Um, design and modification. Uh, the car was fiddled with, it was um, uh, converted, well, it got a new engine and a new styling. Um, the guy on the right there is Harold Beach, who later went on to design uh, the famous uh, Aston Martins, including the DB5, which James Bond had in the 1960s in the movies. Um, so there's popular culture and this vision of um, design, not least because this is the car that Ian Fleming reckoned James Bond should have had, a Bentley, but from the 1920s. And boy, is it associated with a certain kind of Britishness. Um, so let's say no more. The car raced. Motorsports in the 1930s and 40s, well, not so much the 40s because of the Second World War. Um, the car here is in North, uh, Northern Ireland in um, a series of to tourist trophy races. Um, and it appeared in its last race in 1950. This is Le Mans in 1950. And there's Eddie Hall with Joan Hall um, when he's come second. Um, so the artifact itself remains with us. This is the seat on which Eddie sat for 24 hours in 1950. Um, the engineering of the automobile, its style and its design. There are all sorts of features that are open to concern. How do we deal with them and such? And then there's something more. The car, of course, is not just a box on four wheels. It doesn't just have all these stories. It has so many different potential connections that are pertinent to its presentation, its conservation. We can ask, what is this automobile? A question, indeed, that we are fond of at the moment under the heading of ontology. Just what is an artifact? And a simple engagement with an automobile like Eddie Hall's Bentley shows, there's no definitive answer to the question, just what is an automobile? Um, it's an assemblage, to use that term, of relations, of connections, and we've heard the emphasis people are making appropriately on issues of narrative and storytelling. It depends what story you're telling, what interest you have. Uh, Marcel Mauss um, had a notion of the uh, fait total social, the total social fact. And an automobile is arguably one such thing, that automobiles as artifacts connect so widely in our contemporary world. It's almost indistinguishable in their um, use, their manifestation, their distribution through society. They touch almost everything, do automobiles. And as soon, of course, as you start connecting automobiles with human experience, with fuel, industry, warfare, geopolitics, the rest. So an automobile, under this dispersal of its being, what is it? It's all over the place. An automobile is, we might say, the actualization of mobility. It's the, mo sorry, of mobility and also modernity. It's actualization, <coughs> it's how in certain events and experiences, mobility now, manifests itself. Um, and this is a, a bigger message that I want to put across, that when we start tackling, you know, what is a pot? What is an automobile? Of course we can say an automobile can be defined as such. It is this with these, these attributes, and we can vary the attributes. It's green, it's big, uh, and such. But when we actually archaeologically indeed engage with the life of an artifact, it suggests that it might be more useful, instead of thinking of substantives and attributes, car attributes, but rather to seek verbs and adverbs. What is the car doing? What are people doing with it? What processes are involved? Manufacture, experience, and indeed, of course, mobility. So, what is an automobile that it might be represented, conserved, preserved, if we accept this dynamic nature of an artifact rather than its potential to be categorized, classified 
according to substance and attributes. We start thinking, of course, of stakeholder interests. This is regular. The doc how, though, do we document performance and this notion of process? The car moves. How are you going to deal with that? How do we deal with active matter in terms of um, museology or whatever? Um, of course, authorized heritage discourse. That perhaps familiar or unfamiliar notion that there are certain authorized ways of dealing with historical artifacts such as automobiles. Well, it's in the construction at the moment. I'm part of the Historic Vehicle Association of America. Well, I'm kind of like the thorn in their side. Um, where they are absolutely, with the Library of Congress, building up a way of documenting old vehicles. And then there's a notion that I put out elsewhere of focusing perhaps on, yeah, animating the past through, call it heritage, bringing it alive, making active, and I like this notion, enchanting connections between then and now through things. How might we do this? Here are some experiments then. This uh, Eddie Halls Bentley is part of a, a series of projects we've been running on the automotive heritage world. Um, what might we do? First tactic um, relates to design. How things get to be conceived, thought of, dreamed of, and then produced. It is to, if you like, bring together uh, the conceptual, the aspirational, the dream world, and the world that is made. Speculative design, we can say, just what was, just what is, just what might be an automobile. It's thinking of potential as well as actuality. Um, and, well, Google have been doing it. This is their electric car autonomous vehicle for the future. Uh, designing, they're explicitly designing not boxes on four wheels, although it's supposed to look cute. Um, they're designing relationships. This is going to be your new robotic friend. So it's not going to look like a blower Bentley, which is what you saw in the picture before, because they're a bit too aggressive. This is cute and friendly. It will, won't kill you when it's driving you around. The Bentley might. Um, here we have, though, in terms of education or school, whatever you want to call it, here we have our, uh, one of our um, labs where we've got Gordon Murray um, with us and uh, a, a car. Uh, that Louise has been uh, uh, building here, literally, physically, um, uh, building potential cars of the future. And Gordon is a race car designer who's now become very interested in sustainable design. Um, and we use, actually, his um, uh, work in another experiment um, of experimental museology. Um, let me just run this for a few seconds and you might get the idea. So we created a pop-up museum. This is Manhattan, it's 432 Park Avenue. Uh, and they gave us the, uh, the retail unit at the base. And what we did was we stuck three cars in there. And uh, I guess we told a story that might just jar your understanding of the history of the automobile. And um, instead, um, we don't know what there, that's Gordon Murray's, one of Gordon Murray's cars. And then there's a futuristic one in the middle from the 1950s. Um, but the point being, animating the past in heritage, how might we do this when we're dealing with clearly active matter? Um, something else um, uh, we tried, um, again, how do we deal with artifacts under this both ontology, but also this emergence of a new heritage sector? Um, this is not Eddie Hall's Bentley, this is Bill Barranco's 1956 Chevy. Uh, but it's hot-rodded. It's got a whopping great big uh, 407 engine in the front. Um, and what we, Bill was so great, he uh, gave us the car to play with, basically. And uh, this is Mike Pearson, and uh, we uh, drove it into uh, the design school at Stanford um, and uh, 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 did a work around it of theater archaeology, defined as the rearticulation of fragments of the past as real-time event it's actualization again. And we told nine kind of vignette start story scenarios around automobility um, and all sorts. And that's Bill on the right looking suitably amused. Uh, Bill is one of the most down to earth, one of your grief guys you can imagine. He built the car. Um, 
So I'm going to end with a much shorter case here, but again, thinking around um, actualization and experience and the theory that we might build or we actually are already building around those two concepts. Uh, this case involves urban dwelling and the body politic. Um, here the question is how might we work, indeed as archaeologists, um, working with others, with ongoing processes of urbanization. Emphasis again on urbanization as process, dynamics. It's not just defining a city. This is a city It has these features, Gordon Child's approach. How, what, what work goes on in cities? Um, it's actually the biggest project I'm involved in at the moment. It's, it's I'm uh, working on uh, the stuff I'm supposed to work on because I'm a member of the Department of Classics. I'm not supposed to look at Bentleys and uh, such, uh, I'm supposed to um, research ancient Greece and Rome. Well, I am. And there's, um, uh, I'm very interested in ancient urbanism, have been since my PhD. And um, one aspect there for us to exactly consider how as archaeologists, with a handle on the short 5,000 year history of cities, how can we help with ways of thinking and acting in the world that is increasingly urbanized? Um, and my main project, as I say, that I spend all my time on, and the book is five years overdue, is um, modeling the body politic in Greco Roman antiquity. Um, but I've also <coughs> been fascinated and so privileged to be working for 10 years now um, with the um, uh, city of Rotterdam, uh, who are an ex which is an extraordinary municipality, raising questions indeed precisely about agencies in relationship to, in this case, a history with a fascinating. Um, a city with a fascinating history. But here's the little vignette that I'm going to wind up with. Um, and it's, for me, it's about urbanism, urbanization, uh, urban dwelling. Um, it's 2004, and um, a, a student uh, of mine um, uh, put me on to uh, someone who uh, had a quandary. Um, they had a, an, a, two apartments that they rented out in San Jose, and one of the tenants had disappeared eight, for 18 months and never come back. They'd gone to uh, the local um, uh, Supreme Court and asked, what do we do? Can we uh, legally go in? Yes, you can. And so they invited me along to open up the apartment. And this is what we found. Um, it had been, the, the, the tenant had clearly been getting ready to go somewhere, um, but had left or stopped in mid process. Um, and uh, he'd been in the military, um, and I'm just going to show you the pictures. Uh, that was the front room. Um, the bottle is actually um, the one that I took. It was 120 degrees in there. It was really, whoa, strange. Um, yeah, that's the front room, and then that's the dining room. That is a live grenade next to the toaster. <laughs> um, those are his boots. Um, and a jacket. Um, that's <laughs> three bottles of Old Spice and two gun cleaning kits. That's the kitchen um, and bedroom. I did both color and black and white. The colors are kind of curious. I was interested in, uh, you can see it's a certain color palette. The black and white has a different effect. Three American flags in the apartment and a suitcase um, I got a bit upset by it all, actually, and didn't go into the suitcase. It was uh, a really uh, strange experience um, in that he was there, but not there. His ID was in there, um, and so he'd left and not come back with stuff that mattered. And um, uh, so there's a question, what happened? There's ways of getting into that. We could have done research on it, but when it gets forensic. But there's something here about, well, what's this all represent? What is it? What have we just done in entering and countering uh, these circumstances? There's nothing that's represented or to be represented here, we could argue. What is it? Well, I mean, you could tell stories. You can gather and connect in encounter and mediation, engagement. Um, what's going on is a sense of gathering, of collecting of artifacts and what we do is encounter, of course, deal with those assemblages. But we also know that it is not just a cognitive process. 
It is about sensing, thinking, feeling, evaluating pasts and presents, and indeed extrapolating from that. Um, so what are the connections that we might get out of visiting this apartment that afternoon, those few days before it was cleared in August 2004? Experiences, absolutely, I would say, suggest. These are the remnants of experiences of military action. The guy, we know, he was in the military. He'd come out. He'd been living in San Jose. He disappeared. Uh, it's everyday life but with a five inch artillery shell live in your kitchen. That is what's going on there. Um, so let me try and just, what I wanna do, stand us back a little bit and say, the fabulous talks I've been hearing, I've been in the creativity sessions, I've been also in the frontier session yesterday. Um, and you know, people are looking at how we do archeology span uh, such that we attend to the challenges that we think are significant. Um, and I think one of the challenges that we are facing is how do we reconcile a human-centered approach with science? How do we bring the two together without bifurcating? How do we connect all of those bifurcations, those called dualisms, that Cartesian dualisms and all the rest, past and present and such? And I've heard the beginnings, and in some ways very, very well, well worked out, foundations for theory behind these aspirations to work an engaged, creative, archaeological practice in the present. And the three kind of paradigms, if you want, I've called them modus, modi operandi, ways of working, ways of operating. They're not methodologies. Um, they are more attitudes in some ways. Um, experience agency. This notion of experience, archaeological experience, people's experience, we've heard flagged up several times, and is connected with agency, that is our capacity to act to have an effect. Sometimes you don't have agency because you're stopped from doing it, or you just don't have the resources. It's as simple as that. And it is not a matter of, individual, of individuality. Get that out of your heads. That's not what agency is about. A process philosophy, a little bit more about that in a moment, and something um, that came out perhaps of that theater archaeology example, performance design, a paradigm that flags up performance design. So in terms of experience agency, what should we be thinking of? I'm finishing now. The world is constantly remade under inherited conditions. That's process. Working with what remains raises questions of the conditions of practice, agency. Can you do it? And we know, if we're at all interested and should be, in the power, the advantages of a non-representational set of strategies, such as I've indicated, they're about engagement. And post-phenomenological means we're beyond the individual um, sensing, feeling, thinking about um, on their own as a subjectivity, the past. A process relational philosophy has been much discussed in, th in terms of object-oriented ontologies and such. We're still, though, bedeviled by this matter, immateriality, mat material, immaterial, bifurcation, mind and body. Um, but there's plenty of ways through it, and I see elements of it. Um, Hegelian Marxism is where I started with a relational philosophy. Uh, but you can run through, I mentioned Bergson, Whitehead, uh, Deleuzian nomadics, um, and indeed, the one who's my favorite at the moment, Michel Serre. Fundamentally, acting against a substance ontology and instead emphasizing, focusing on what we do and how we do it. We are part of what we seek to understand as we work with what remains. We are not external, transcendent viewers, builders of knowledge, whatever. And finally, performance design, mobilizing the past and the present with appropriate concepts drawn from scenography, Dramaturgy, choreography, improvisation, performance writing. This was what I wrote the book Theatre Archaeology for with Mike. That's it. I think we're on the, I, I know people talk about where's the, theory coming from and going to. I see so much going on that's vital. It's fascinating. We're getting good 
at really adventurous creative practices. We are understanding heritage and how it works with far more subtlety, with far more indeed awareness of what agencies precisely are involved. Um, if you want to find out a bit more about what I've said, um, there's me at mshanks.com, my photography is at Archaeographer, and pretty much anything I think you might want to read uh, is at my academia site. Thank you.